Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about technologies, projects and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I am Friederike Ernst and I'm here with Brian Fabian Crane. And today we're speaking with Ed Felton, who is the co-founder of Arbitrum, which is a roll-up solution on top of Ethereum. And we will talk about this um, in great detail in just a bit. But before we talk with Ed about Arbitrum, um, we would like to tell you about our sponsors this week. So first of all, we have Gnosis Safe. So Gnosis Safe is a security standard for Web3, reimagining the future of ownership and value coordination. It works as a multi-signature based smart contract account and is compatible across popular EVM chains. It's totally programmable to give the power to you know, customize permission and access, set user limits and ensure maximum security while doing so. It secures over 60 billion dollars worth of assets and caters equally to individual DAOs, institutions and enterprises. So try Gnosis Safe out today and to secure your assets. It's available on Ethereum, Optimism, Polygon, BSC, Avalanche, Arbitrum, is it? Yes. Very good. <laughs> and so to do that, go to gnosis-safe.io. We are also brought to you by Teleho. Teleho is redefining the wallet as a public good. You can think of it like a community owned alternative to MetaMask. With Teleho, you can enter the metaverse with a Web3 wallet that's fully community owned and operated, and it's the first wallet that's also a DAO. Teleho's commitment to community ownership and public goods stretches beyond the wallet. In January, they, beca they became the first sponsor of Ether.js, an open source JavaScript library helping developers connect to Ethereum. And they recently announced a pledge to commit 2.5% of their total token supply to Gitcoin Aqueduct. Head over to tallyho.cash to try the Tallyho Community Edition and play around with its features before its upcoming version 1 launch and um, the launch of the DAO. Um, and our last spon sponsor, Stake Wallet. Stake Wallet is your new favorite multi-chain mobile wallet that puts the power of, Re of Web3 at your fingertips. In just a few tabs, you can stake and manage your assets um, on over 22 built-in protocols, including all major EVMs, non-EVMs, and uh, layer tools like Arbitrum. Stake Wallet is adding new features at light speed, so you always have um, the best support across all chains. Just in the last two weeks, they've shipped three-tab BNB chain staking and Harmony One staking. Stake Wallet has also um, um, a pretty good NFT support. Um, on, mo on, on a mobile wallet and you can view all your NFTs in one place. And it's about to become the first mobile wallet with um, Arbitrum NFT support as well. Watch out for an announcement um, at NFT New York City on June 20th. You can download Stake Wallet today on iOS or Android at stakewallet.fi spelled stake like the meat. Fantastic. Ed, it is such a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for having me. Ed, you um, are uh, you are an OG cypherpunk. <laughs> you <laughs> I suppose you so. have been doing this longer than all of us. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself um, and tell us about crypto pre-blockchain. Sure. Yeah, so I've been working in... Um, uh, I've been playing around with software for uh, a long time, actually, since the 1970s, believe it or not, um, and um, got involved in security and privacy and cryptography uh, research going back to the 90s. I spent um, quite a few years uh, teaching at Princeton University in the computer science department, and uh, a lot of my research there was around uh, cryptography and security and getting into ideas of digital money even before uh, this sort of explosion of cryptocurrency started with, uh, uh, you know, with Satoshi's original um, Bitcoin paper. Um, but I got interested in uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchain really early. Um, and started doing research in the area. And um, yeah, that's kind of what led up to, uh, uh, to Arbitrum. But you know, over the years, I've been involved in a lot of different security things um, as a researcher. Um, and um, also, um, uh, maybe surprisingly to folks in this space, um, as uh, working in the government as well. So um, yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of that has really helped me get a perspective on what's happening now in the crypto space. You used to be the deputy CTO of the USA. So 
for, forgive me this question, but I'm not American. And what what does what does the CTO and the deputy CTO get to do? Sure. So basically, um, as, yeah, as deputy CTO, I was a member of the White House staff and a senior advisor to the president, then President Obama. Um, and basically, the job of the CTO and deputy CTO uh, is to advise the president and the president's um, advisors about things having to do with technology. So we were not building stuff. We weren't running systems. We weren't the ones whose pagers would go off in the middle of the night if there was some kind of an incident. Um, we were producing words and advice, but rooted in an understanding of technology. So if you know there was some kind of security breach somewhere, or if um, there was a policy issue around uh, technology, then we would work on it. So as an example, I worked some on encryption policy You know, should the government regulate uh, or ban um, end-to-end -end encryption? I worked on um, AI and machine learning. Um, I was one of the folks who drove the national national policy initiative on AI and machine learning back in those days, and things like that. So basically, advising senior government people and including uh, up to and including the president. Kind of an amazing job to have. And did you do any uh, crypto-related work as part of that as well? Yeah, I did some. Um, you know, this was very early days in terms of government figuring out, um, thinking about crypto. But one of the things I was working on was trying to get people across the different departments of the U.S. government to start talking about crypto and what they should do, help help make sure that the different parts of government um, of the executive branch understood what was going on and uh, And we're starting down the road of thinking about what they should do, whether it's, you know, people thinking about should we have a central bank digital dollar, um, as well as, you know, people who did things like consumer protection and uh, various kinds of regulation, make sure that they understood what was going on and we're going to take a thoughtful approach to it. So I was involved in sort of early attempts to get that conversation going within the, the, the U.S. government. So I'm curious because you mentioned before that, like, you know, you had this sort of uh, perspective on on crypto and blockchain, you know, that was like maybe different because of, you know, the work you did before. I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about that sort of, you know, when you discover Bitcoin, like what was your perspective and how has it changed as the industry has evolved? Yeah, so. Yes, yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about that. Well, that particular that comment of how my work in government has um, uh, has uh, affected my views on this. First of all, I have been a regulator, or I've worked in a regulatory agency. I worked at the Federal Trade Commission for a while, which was as as their uh, chief technologist, which is in the U.S. government is the main uh, agency that protects people against uh, fraud, commercial fraud, and scams, um, and so. You know, that mindset of how do we make sure that companies are not just stealing from people, um, you know, the, the equivalent of something like what in the crypto world would be a rug pull or some kind of other, you know, really fraudulent activity. Um, and sort of thinking about what do you need to do to help protect people against that and what is the role of government in trying to shut down the bad actors and try to get the money back and give it to the people who it was stolen from. Um, and so I got some perspective from dealing with some of the types of fraud and scams that were going on online in those days. That was like 2011 and 12. So then I, I did that for a little while. Then I went back to being an academic. And during that academic time, um, starting around 2012, um, is when I, 13 is when I discovered Bitcoin and got really interested in this, uh, this stuff as a research topic. And like questions of how people could protect themselves and how you could know uh, that something that some software was telling you was going to happen, was actually going to happen, um, was, was part of that. Plus just like understanding basic questions like is proof of work incentive compatible? That is like, um, does it actually incent miners to behave in a cooperative way? Which turns out to be a much more complicated question than you might think. But anyway, then sometime sort of early on, I, I learned about smart contracts and this idea that you could do run software on top of a blockchain. And I thought this was the coolest thing ever. Um, 
and got really excited about the tech, especially what, you know, it as a vehicle for, uh, for building software. Cause I like been involved in and seen the development or sort of early development of internet and web technology and saw sort of that stuff go through its very early commercial birth and, and some growth and some growing pains. So I'm like, okay, this is going to happen with smart contracts. This is going to be huge as a software platform. Um, that in turn led me to thinking about, well, like what are the technical barriers to that technology actually getting used by a billion people. And um, well, one of the big technical barriers that seemed obvious at the time was scalability. And that in turn is what led to the work that sort of the birth of Arbitrum in early 2014, um, sort of as an attempt to try to solve the problem of how to scale this technology up so that it could get the use that I figured at the, I think a lot of people did at the time it, that it was going to demand. So, so, so let's talk about Arbitrum in just a bit. That, but basically thinking back about the very early P2P community or the pre-blockchain P2P community, there are large reservations um, or you know holdouts um, that are very skeptical of blockchain technology as a whole. Why do you think that is? I, well, so I think it's a bunch of things. Um, and... We saw some of this with the early, like the early web technologies. Um, I mean, we have to admit that some of the things that go on in this space are basically just scams. They're people who are um, who are dishonest, or people who um, think they're honest but are actually doing things that are really dangerous. So this idea that it's kind of a you know a wild west that people are doing all kinds of uh, risky and scammy and dangerous things, along with a lot of legitimate and exciting building, that pretty much reminds me of the early internet days. And there was a bunch of skepticism there. But I think there's ep extra skepticism in our space, of our space. And it's for a bunch of reasons. I think, like, there's a natural skepticism about new tech areas, especially ones that have a lot of venture capital pouring into them. Um, there's a natural skepticism about any, you know, about finance and finance as a field and the kind of people who hang out in that space and in the tech space, right? Like right now, tech people are kind of out of fashion. The idea that um, that like people who are building and running tech things are like dangerous and antisocial, and that the tech industry might not be good for the world. Uh, like I don't buy that at all, but it is kind of a fashionable view, and I think we get some of that. Plus, we get some of what happens because we're new and people are trying a lot of a lot of things and some of them fail. Um, and then I think there's this other dimension to it, which I can't quite explain, that it's kind of become fashionable in some circles to say that, like, everything happening in the blockchain space is just a giant Ponzi scheme, um, which I think to anyone who's in the space and paying attention is obviously wrong. But, you know... I think it's become fashionable in some circles to say this is all bogus and nothing, nothing interesting going on, um, which, you know, I think could not be further from the truth. There are, there are some people in this space who are liars and dangerous and so on, but um, there's also a ton of people doing really interesting and solid work. Um, and, you know, and that's what, that's what will last. Just like in the early internet, there are a lot of people trying crazy things and nobody remembers them. But, you know, people do remember those who actually built valuable stuff over time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's let's talk. So you mentioned in 2014, right? You had this kind of uh, early scaling work you did that, you know, kind of later became Arbitrum. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what was that 2014 project? Yeah. Well, so it started just with the idea, the idea of which I think today we would call layer two, which was that you could have something that was basically a chain, that if you had a base chain, which had smart contracts or something like it on the base chain, that you could build a chain above it or off on the side and then anchor the security of that second chain sort of in the first chain. So you could have this thing where you could have a chain running off on the side, 
that it would use only a little bit of the capacity of the base chain. But if you did it right, you could sort of inherit the security of the base chain. So that was kind of the key idea to move almost all of the work off the main chain, but have just enough functionality on the main chain to maintain security. And the key idea that enabled that was what's now called interactive fraud proofs, which is basically a way of resolving a dispute between two parties about what is the correct outcome of a computation and do that in a way that is that involves very little work sort of on the base layer. In early 2014 is when that idea sort of came along. And for most of 2014, I had a diagram on my whiteboard in my office at Princeton that had sort of a dot was a diagram that sort of showed the steps of an interactive fraud proof. Um, and then in the fall of 2014 semester, there was one of my colleagues, Arvind Narayanan, taught a course on, um, on, blockchain tech, on blockchain tech. And all the students in the course had to do a course project where they would design or build something. So a group of, I think, six students got together, and they, five or six, and they decided to build a version of this thing that I had on my whiteboard. Um, and um, one day, sitting around a table, we came up with the name Arbitrum for it. And so they built a kind of very early proto Arbitrum, which didn't quite work and didn't have the features of you know anything like today's system. Obviously, you know it, over eight years the system has evolved a lot. Um, but ba but basically the first version they built in fall of 2014, and you can actually go on YouTube and if you search for something like Arbitrum Princeton students or something like that, you'll see a um, a video of their course presentation at the end of that semester that they gave in January of 2015. And they talk about, uh, you know, basic ideas that you might still recognize in Arbitrum today. So that was the very first version of Arbitrum. What was the base layer that it was built on back then? Well, that was the funny thing. There wasn't really a base layer. We had to just assume that there would be one. So. The idea back then is you had to build something that kind of simulated the base layer. Um, yeah, so this was before Ethereum was, uh, you know, was at the point where you could use it. Um, so, um, yeah, there wasn't really a base layer at that point. We knew there was going to be one and that, you know, we had a design that what could be sort of agnostic as to what base layer it was on, you know, much later when we decided to commercialize the technology, when we started our company, we said, okay, Ethereum is the place to go for a lot of, you know, for a lot of reasons we can talk about later, maybe. Um, yeah, but initially it was agnostic and we just had a kind of simulated base layer underneath. I'm curious, was this idea of like a, a kind of like a layer two, was this like the first time this came up? I mean, I know Lightning Network wasn't like that much later, but I think it was maybe 2015 or something that the Lightning, oh, were there other ideas like this around? I mean, I don't know of the idea of a layer two being out there before. I would hesitate to claim I was the first one to think of it, but, um, but you know, because good ideas pop up everywhere and, and repeatedly. Um, there was something not too different from, there was a much less efficient and probably less practical um, thing that was related to the interactive fraud proofs um, that was in um, uh, academic paper from 2011 from, by Ron Kennedy and some other people um, uh, called uh, Referee Delegation of Computation. Um, so I would say, you know, this sort of emerged out of a cloud of ideas that were out there. And, you know, as a researcher, I often felt like there were ideas swimming around in my head trying to find the right way to latch onto each other to make a, you know, a, like a design or a solution. Uh, and I feel like that's kind of what happened, uh, at least for me at that time, that there were ideas that people were talking and thinking about and like this particular combination of ideas and the way that it could, you could use it to scale smart contracts sort of gelled around that time. So anyway, so 2015, right? The students finished this project. And so we have this thing, which is where a sort of early pre-prototype proof of concepts thing sort of existed. 
And this is where this, this uh, sort of story evolution of Arbitrum collides with my story about working in government because um, my sort of my life took a detour not long after that, which is I got invited to go work at the White House. Uh, and so I did. You don't say no to that kind of offer. Um, and so Arbitrum just kind of got put on the shelf um, during the whole time, you know, being like a somewhat senior member of the White House staff is the most all-consuming job I've ever seen. And so there's no time for anything else. Um, afterwards, in uh, January of 2017, at the end of that administration, they pushed all of us staffers out the door. And um, I went back to being an academic. And um, while I was there trying to sort of get my bearings again and figure out what I was going to do for research, these two, one day, these two grad students, um, Harry Kalodner and Stephen Goldfeder walk into my office and say, um, hey, remember that Arbitrum thing from before you went off to the government? And we're like, oh, yeah, that was I thought that was fun. And so they were they said, let's do that again. So like they came to me and said they wanted to work on this project with me and like turn it into a more sort of mature and complete system. Um, and uh, a year and a half later, we were the three co-founders of you know, of Off-Chain Labs, which is a company that's built the commercial version of Arbitrum. So that was sort of the revival of Arbitrum, which was sort of really came from the two of them um, coming back and sort of reminding me of this and saying we should do this. And then one thing led to another. We had an academic paper that we published in 2018, um, summer of 2018, and then like almost immediately afterwards, we, for we formed the company because it looked like something that had commercial potential and we wanted to like actually get it out there into you know the hands of uh, of users yeah super interesting and basically i think the stress level of being a crypto founder is uh, put put into perspective by having you know an even more stressful job beforehand so i think you you played this very well <laughs> yeah just like there's frankly no comparison because what we do today is important. It's important to us. It's important to a lot of other people. We take the responsibility of building this technology really seriously. But, you know, the, the stakes when you're an advisor to the president of the United States are higher. That like many of the decisions that he made or issues he worked on were literally life and death for other people. Um, and being involved in responding to issues like, you know, terrorism and um, or even, you know, even discussions around economic policy where you're talking about do, you know, where the decisions that are getting made can affect whether tens or hundreds of thousands of people have jobs, um, whether people lose their homes and have health care and all those sorts of things, right? Um, being around people who deal with those issues every day, it makes the the problems of a of a startup founder seem seem mild by comparison. I often tell people that that job completely recalibrated my sense of of stress. So you know, this seems like a breeze <laughs> by comparison. I'm happy to hear that. I will try that in my next life. Um, so um, let, let's let's talk about how you guys settled on using Ethereum as a base layer. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we knew we wanted to use, we wanted to pick a base layer. Um, and Ethereum seemed like, so, th and of course, this is one of the steps from being an academic prototype where you say, hey, look, this is a super general thing. It can run on top of any base layer that has, you know, basic smart contract functionality. But if it's going to be a product, it's got to run on, on an actual thing. And so Ethereum seemed like the obvious choice for a bunch of reasons. First of all, you know, it was, it had, had, and still has the most developers and the most users and so on of smart contract based um, technology. We really liked the Ethereum community and sort of the way that it's governed and the sort of the openness of it. And we really liked it as a community. And we felt like it was a place where we could be comfortable where the sort of th the sort of experience we were trying to build would be consistent with what the Ethereum community was going to do, um, and we've always, from the beginning, seen what we're doing as not a sort of as a complement to Ethereum to try to make Ethereum better. Um, so it seemed really obvious from the beginning that Ethereum was where we wanted to be, that we had to focus on something, and um, 
uh, and pretty much every criterion um, Ethereum looked like the best place to be. We also thought, you know, just from a pure sort of um, in terms of like the the need for what we were doing, that Ethereum was going to be the system that hit congestion and an increase in in transaction fees uh, first. Uh, part, you know, partly because of um, you know technical attributes of Ethereum, but also because just there were so many people there, and the community was growing in such a nice way. Cool. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, let let's uh, let's talk a little bit about rollups because I think rollups is something that you know most listeners will like have some kind of awareness of. You know, they've heard of it, but at the same time probably don't quite understand it. So can you explain what are rollups? Sure. Yeah, so a rollup is a uh, is a chain that operates as an independent chain, but that has its security anchored in a, 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 an existing big chain, in our case, Ethereum. Um, and so the key idea is that we keep the data, the sort of input data of the transactions. What are the transactions that users submit? And those get recorded on the Ethereum chain. Um, and, but we move the computation and the storage, basically the heavy lifting of operating the chain off onto a separate place, onto the separate Arbitrum chain that has its own nodes and its own, uh, uh, its own systems um, participating in it. Um, but the key thing that makes rollups, uh, I think, really nice is that they, at least ones like ours, is that they can operate trustlessly, meaning that all the data that you need in order to um, be a first class actor in the system, in order to know exactly what the chain has done and participate fully in the protocol, that's all recorded on the Ethereum chain. And then the settlement of uh, of transactions that happen on the rollup, those are also somehow settled back to the L1 chain so that the Ethereum chain knows what is the state root of our layer two chain. So what that means is you get better performance and lower cost because we move a lot of the stuff off the Ethereum chain where gas and transactions are, are pretty expensive because there's a lot of demand but we still can anchor the security of the rollup chain in Ethereum. So if you trust Ethereum and you believe at least one member of our community is honest, then you can trust our chain as well. So that's sort of the value proposition, not only of Arbitrum, but of rollups generally. You can inherit the security of the layer one Ethereum chain, but at the same time, you can move most of the work off of it. And so transactions are a lot cheaper and you can have more capacity. So just to, to kind of clarify this, so let's say today I'm sending a transaction on Ethereum, you know, I, I just send it on Ethereum, I can check on Etherscan, okay, that's just my transaction. But in this case, I would send the transaction, you know, to a bunch of Arbitrum nodes. Well, to one, yeah, to one Arbitrum node. Yeah, so let me talk about the user experience of this, right? So if you're using Ethereum, right, like you said, you're maybe use, you're using a wallet, um, and your wallet has the address of some node, the URL of some node um, in it, so that when when you approve a transaction, your wallet puts your puts your signature or your address's signature on it. Your wallet will send that to to an Ethereum node, right? And then the Ethereum magic happens, and sometime later you get back or you see you see the result of your transaction, right? If you're using Arbitrum, um, it's basically the same user experience. In a sense, you can use the same wallet and you, um, instead of putting the address of an Ethereum node, um, instead of your wallet ha having the address of an Ethereum node and sending the transaction to the Ethereum node, your wallet has the address of an Arbitrum node and it sends the transaction to the Arbitrum node. So we've done the work to make Arbitrum compatible with Ethereum so that the same transactions will run on it. You send literally the same bits that you, your wallet would have sent to the Ethereum node, it can send to the Arbitrum node. And someone who's developing a smart contract to run on Arbitrum, they'll send literally the same bits that they would send to an Ethereum node in order to deploy the contract. So you achieve a level of compatibility in the user experience. What happens 
after your transaction gets to that node is a bit different. And I can walk through kind of what are the steps um, if you like. Um, but in terms of user experience or developer experience, um, it should, it's designed to feel just like using Ethereum, except that uh, transaction fees are lower and response time is shorter. So yeah, so, if you, so let me walk through what actually happens with your transaction. There's kind of a front end and a back end of a system like Arbitrum. There's sort of two phases. The first one is sequencing, and that's all about the system receiving your transaction, putting all the transactions into order, you know, one in front of the other, and then recording those ordered transactions. And then there's the second phase, which is the execution and settlement phase, which is the, which is the phase that figures out what is the result of executing those transactions in the sequence that came out of the first phase, right? So, but let's talk about like a typical transaction. So user makes a transaction using a, some user interface on their wallet. Eventually they click that button on their wallet that says to, to send the transaction, right? So that puts their digital signature on the transaction. The transaction gets sent to an Arbitrum node. The Arbitrum node will forward that transaction automatically to the Arbitrum sequencer which is a component that's receiving transactions from all over the place. Um, and the sequencer emits an ordered sequence of transactions. So it publishes a feed of um, a real-time feed of transactions. And so um, the node that you sent your transaction to might be subscribed to that feed. So the node will see your transaction in the feed, see what the result is, and send that back to you um, immediately. It's usually around one second. So, and, and users love this, this part of the system, right? Um, so then the sequence of the Arbitrum sequencer will later take your transaction and a bunch of transactions that came in around the same time and put them all into a batch, um, which is just like a bunch of the data of all the different transactions packed one after the other. It will compress that batch using a using a, you know, a, a, a common um, compression algorithm. And it will take that compressed batch and post it on the Ethereum chain um, as Ethereum call data. Um, and the reason that's important is that that data is that what the transactions were and what order the sequencer put them into is like fully recorded and notarized on the Ethereum chain. So everyone has access to it. And there's no dispute about possible about what, what the transactions were or in what order. Tell us about the sequencer. Sure. So yeah, so the sequencer right now is a centralized component that our that we the Arbitrum team run. Um, and the sequencer follows a first come, first serve policy for putting the transactions into order. That is first transaction to arrive, whichever transaction arrives earlier gets to be earlier in the ordering. Um, and so currently, um, it's the sequencer is trusted to establish an order on the transactions, but it's not trusted for any other purpose. Um, in particular, the sequencer can't create transactions out of nothing because transactions have to be signed by the user, right? And the sequencer can't forge those digital signatures. The sequencer could try to throw some transactions away, but there's an there's an anti-censorship mechanism that people can use to force their transactions into the sequence, even if the sequencer isn't cooperating. The sequencer currently is a centralized component, and we've, you know, it's in our roadmap to decentralize the sequencer so that you have a committee of sequencers, and as long as a majority of those are honest, then you get a fair, a fair sequence. Yeah, it's just one question I have on this is. So the transact the, the transaction information, right? It gets put into I guess each Ethereum block, or it gets put into the Ethereum chain, you know, on some regularity. But as an Arbitrum user, does that mean I also have to sort of you know like the confirmation or like the finality of my transaction is like when it gets recorded on Ethereum, or can I rely on it before that? Yeah. So. The, you get definite finality when your transaction is recorded on Ethereum. And so the, and, and the main time factor there is just the Ethereum finality time, right? So if you're going to wait for, say, 20 Ethereum blocks for finality, you know, that's about five minutes. 
So all, the sequencer also publishes this real-time feed of transactions. And that's the sequencer's promise that it will record the transactions in that order. And so if you trust that promise, then you can use the, res then you can use the sequencer's real-time feed to, uh, to know what the result of your transact, what the ordering of transactions will be. And your transaction will show up in that feed in, a, in about a second. So most in practice, most um, applications choose to, have their UI, ha, choose to have their UI rely on that sequencer feed. But you are trusting the sequencer's promise of order. But again, it's only ordering. It's not what the transactions are that, you have to, that, that you'd be trusting there. So that's your choice, basically. You can get one second soft finality, which means finality unless the sequencer is lying to you. Sequencer is making you a promise to record the data in that order. And the sequencer always has the power to keep that promise. But fundamentally, you're relying on it to keep the promise if you're relying on that feed. Or you can wait until the transaction sequence is recorded on the Ethereum chain. And that is going to take as long as Ethereum finality does. So the sequencer then um, sends the compressed data um, to the Ethereum main chain. Um, so, I mean, it has to pay gas for that. And basically, there's no, there's no way of forcing um, validators or miners to include a transaction, right? So how do you guys make sure that you can, you can definitely have that call data on every Ethereum block? Yeah, so... The first, so this gets to what happens in the second, sort of the back end phase or the execution phase of the protocol. And there's kind of two ways of thinking about this, but the key idea in the, in the sort of the execution phase is that you have this sequence of transactions and everybody knows and agrees on what the sequence is because it's recorded on Ethereum, right? Now, Given that sequence of transactions, there's, um, there's, there's something called the state transition function. The state transition function is a deterministic function, which takes the next transaction and the current state of the chain and produces some changes to the state of the chain, possibly, and then also possibly emits a block on the Arbitrum chain. So that's a fully deterministic function. And what that means is the result of it depends only on the current state and the next transaction. And of course, the current state only depends on the genesis state and all of the transactions in between, right? So the current state at any time is fully determinable from the sequence of transactions that have been recorded. And that's actually really important. One of the things that makes this a rollup is that anybody can start with the genesis state of the Arbitrum chain and replay all of the transactions just on, by themselves without um, needing to sync to anything and then know what the current state is. But also, if you're in real time, if you're a node, and you're just watching to see which transactions arrive in the sequence, you can execute that state transition function yourself without needing to synchronize or get to consensus with anybody. And you can know what the correct result of executing that sequence of transactions is, right? And there is a single correct result because the state transition function is fully deterministic. So most of the time, what nodes do is they watch the sequence and then they execute the state transition function themselves privately. And any honest party can do that um, by executing the protocol. And you could do that using you know, software that, that we'll give to you for free and you can like look at the source code for and so on. So that's how all honest parties can know what the result of executing the chain is. And that's sort of the common case of what happens. But at this point, every honest party in the universe in principle knows what the correct outcome of the chain is, except the Ethereum chain doesn't know. And the reason the Ethereum chain doesn't know is it doesn't have enough gas to execute all of the Arbitrum transactions, right? The whole point of something like Arbitrum is to be able to do more work than Ethereum can do. And it's sort of, you know, by definition follows from that, that Ethereum can't emulate the full, the full execution of the Arbitrum chain. So we have this other piece we call the roll-up protocol, which is how participants in the protocol can, can cooperatively convince or prove 
to the Ethereum chain what the result of executing these transaction is. In other words, like what is the the block header hash of the of of you know the next block of the Arbitrum chain. So there's a so we have the the settlement protocol which does that. So does does that sort of make sense? There's like two two aspects of this. If you're an honest party, you can just watch the sequence and execute everything for yourself and you know what the unique correct answer is. But also on the side, there's this protocol going on to convince the Ethereum chain what the result is. Um, and that's necessary for things like bridging or if some party wants to be able to wants to know the result without needing to emulate everything themselves. Right, you can go to the Ethereum chain and say, look, the Ethereum chain has confirmed or no, sort of notarized a particular um, block header hash for the Arbitrum chain. And so you know that that's good. And how, how do you make sure that uh, the block header hash is included in each Ethereum block? So, I mean, basically, you have no control over the miners, right? Or the validator. So, in principle, they could exclude you. Right. So it's not included in every Ethereum block. It's just included periodically. In practice, it's every few hours. There's a checkpoint of the Arbitrum chain will get recorded onto the Ethereum chain. And so you don't need to get it into every block. You just need to sort of get a checkpoint in periodically. Uh, okay. So basically the hard finality is, is then not a minute, uh, like the soft finality, but a couple of hours until it's included on the main chain. So, uh, but no, actually, so finality, if, if, if by finality, you mean that every honest party knows and agrees on what the result is, then you have that back in the beginning, once your transaction is sequenced, right? Because once your transaction has been sequenced, then the result of your transaction is, is deterministically knowable to everyone. That is every honest party knows what they can figure out for themselves, what the result of your transaction is. And this sort of final recording of the checkpoint on Ethereum, this is just Ethereum finding out what the correct result is, which everyone else already knew. The, the, the thing is, basically, if you say you inherit security from Ethereum, then, um, then basically you, 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 need to, you need to wait until it's been included um, in the main chain. Ah, so there's one, there's one more piece that I haven't said yet, which I hope will close this loop. And that is that this, the piece of the protocol that records these checkpoints back onto Ethereum, this piece is fully trustless. What that means is any one honest party can force the correct result to be recorded. And so that means that you don't need to rely on anyone else to ensure that your transaction will be recorded back onto the Ethereum chain. You yourself can force that to happen. In fact, any, any party can force the correct rec the recording the recording of the correct result so if you believe that ethereum it will operate securely and if you believe that at least one participant in the arbitrum protocol is honest then you have a guarantee that only the correct that the correct result and only the correct result will be recorded on ethereum and so you need there to be just one honest party and that can be you that's assuming the sequencer has uh given the honest uh, has sort of broadcast the honest ordering of transactions well so the sequencer in effect the sequencers the sequencers ordering is well the sequencers ordering is by definition the truth of the order of transactions in other words the sequencer decides the order and then this execution layer determines what is the correct result of executing the transactions in that order. The sequencer doesn't, doesn't make any claims about the results of executing those transactions. It just says, um, here's a set of transactions. You can think of it like, a, like an ordered mempool if you're thinking in um, analogy to Ethereum, right? Ethereum has the mempool, which is all the transactions that have been submitted, but not yet executed. Right. So the Arbitrum sequencer produces something that's like an ordered mempool. It's a set of transactions that have been submitted and they're in some order. And then what the execution phase of the protocol does is it takes those transactions and runs them or tries to run them um, in order. Right. So the sequencer has established an order 
And then the job of the execution and settlement phase is to figure out what is the one correct result of executing those transactions in that order. Yeah, so that makes sense. But of course, uh, you know, you said before the sequencer does, uh, you know, sort of uh, first in, you know, orders it by the order received. And of course, that's something uh, they could lie about, no? Yes, that's right. The sequencer can lie about ordering. Um, we believe that a sequencer that does that regularly would get caught. But over time, you know, as we move to a distributed sequencer, the idea is you have a set of sequencers and you brought you multicast your transaction to all of them. And then each of the sequencers publishes its order, which it claims was the order of arrival at it. And then there's a kind of, so you, then you have like the published sequence of each of the sequencer instances. And then there's a sort of fair merging algorithm, which merges those sequences. And it, it produces a, pr the fair merge algorithm has this property, which is, which is roughly that if transaction A is ahead of transaction B in a super majority of those sequencers outputs, then it will be ahead, A will be ahead of B in the, the merge. So if you believe that a, you know, a, that a super majority of the sequencer instances are honestly doing first come first served, then the sort of whole distributed sequencer part of the protocol will produce first come first served. And this will actually, in effect, solve the MEV issue, right? So basically, currently, the in in the centralized in the centralized uh, sequencer, in principle, the sequencer could extract everything that would on main chain be known as MEV. In principle, it that's could like could in principle, yeah. And I, I mean, I'll take your word for it that it currently doesn't. But basically, if you have that sequency sequencer competition where basically the relative ordering is kind of um, uh, is uh, kind of compared between lots of different sequences, that entire kind of worms is closed, right? That's right. That's, that's exactly right. Both parts of that, a dishonest sequencer could extract a lot of value, presumably by, um, by reordering or by selling, auctioning off position and so on. Uh, it could. That we currently run the sequencer and we do not do that. But long run, the solution is to move to a distributed sequencer. Um, and that way, you don't have to trust any one party. Um, it is the case now that the sequence we produce is visible to everyone. And so if we cheated blatantly, it would be evident. Um, also, you know, we, we, the Arbitrum team, have a, a real incentive to not make our system terrible in that way. Um, by by cheating our users, um, but nonetheless, right? Um, obviously, a distributed uh, sequencer is uh, is better, and that is where we are headed. I'm I'm curious since we brought up the topic of MEV, which you know I, I think has definitely become like a huge topic, right? That like lots of people think about. Uh, this does sound like pretty elegant, actually. But I'm curious, does that actually, you know, what Federica said, does that fully remove MEV, or is there still some degree of MEV there? Well, that's a super, that's a super deep question, um, because it partly depends what you mean by MEV, right? Um, certainly, timing matters, and there are circumstances where if Alice can see that the thing happens and get a transaction in in reaction to it faster than Bob can, that Alice will be benefited, right? And so the ability to react quickly to events more quickly than other people and to get a transaction in faster than someone else actually does benefit people. And the thing about it, a first arrival policy is that, you know, someone can get an advantage by being close in network distance to, uh, to the sequencer. Of course, when you distribute the sequencer, if the instances are all over the world, you know, that becomes a more complicated game. So there are issues around ordering. The other thing to say about MEV is that there, or the idea that of sort of exploiting order for, in order to get, to make money, um, there are circumstances where people, where like a regular user 
can benefit from uh, either reordering or from selling a position in the order. So here's, here's a good example. Suppose that you want to do a trade in an AMM like, say, Uniswap or, 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 an, or an equivalent. And your trade is big enough that it would actually move the price in that, you know, in that automated market. Um, so if the price was sort of at the sort of global market equilibrium price and your trade would move the price a little way away from that, there's an arbitrage opportunity that is available to whoever can get a transaction in immediately behind yours, right? So if you're the person who's going to do this first trade, um, it sure would be nice. So you might say, well, um, great, I'll, I'll do the first trade and then I'll exploit that arbitrage opportunity myself and make some profit. The thing is to exploit the arbitrage opportunity, you have to do the opposite of your initial trade. So um, you know, if you wanted to do the initial trade, you're not going to do that. But there is a profitable opportunity to be right behind you in the sequence. And if you could sell that, then you would actually you could actually benefit from it, right? You, the end user. And in fact, the economics of this get a little complicated, but if you do a trade that is big enough to move the market, you've suffered a little bit of loss due to, to slippage in the terminal in the in the jargon. And you can actually regain that by selling the position right behind you in the ordering. So there are cases where um, like clever ordering or bundling of transactions can be beneficial to users and not just a way to sort of a drain value away from, from users. Um, and so personally, I'm a believer in opt-in um, transaction bundling. Um, and I think that's the direction this is going to go in systems that emphasize fairness. That is, you as a user can submit your transaction directly to the sequencer and get um, you know, first in, first out um, ordering. Or if you think that there's an, if you think that you might benefit from having your transaction bundled with other people's by some party you you trust, you could submit your transaction through them, send it to them, and they, you know, produce a bundle and, and submit it. So this gets kind of complicated, but the bottom line is that there are circumstances where it's beneficial to users to be able to do bundling of transactions. And if that is purely voluntary, a thing that happens for you because you opt into it, um, I think that's a good thing. But the idea that someone is sitting there watching your transactions and like reordering it so that they can steal some, um, you know, some fractional ETH from you every time you do a thing, um, that's really harmful. Um, so yeah, so I mean, we've been thinking a lot about how can we minimize um, MEV and how could we make it so that people who want to opt in to transaction ordering can do it. And we've been trying to build a kind of ecosystem that allows that to happen. But a big part of that is this sort of first in, first out, or first come, first served approach to sequencing, which we think is really important, an important part of our model and makes it not completely resistant to MEV, um, but um, much more resistant than alternatives. I think that's really commendable. So I think, I mean, in this space, there's this prevalent narrative that MEV is actually good because it secures the network. And I think this is a false narrative and I don't, I don't understand why more people don't call it out because obviously it's the user who pays for it. If you, if you actually do the analysis of how much is spent on MEV, it's, it's, around 1% of total transaction volume. So it's huge. It's actually, it's it's humongous. So basically, if you guys were to uh, were to tweak your sequencer, uh, you could be enormously rich with this. But yeah, so it's, I mean, it's it's a huge, it's a huge market. And I think basically finding, finding ways that are provably fair and that kind of preclude that super important. I need, to, I feel like I need to do a, a, a mini rant here. Because uh, I think you're exactly right that this like MEV extraction is it's a tax on users, but it's a tax that's hidden. You don't know how much was extracted from you or when. Um, and I think that's not how fees, that's not how networks should fund themselves. If you're going to fund your network, you should do it from fees that are visible to users. So you users know what they're paying so that it's in that wallet pop up that when you do this transaction, this is what you pay for the transaction, that it's visible. And, you know, I'm a big believer in that the costs of transactions should be visible, they should be fair. 
and they should be related to the cost of operating the network. And I think MEV is none of those things. MEV extraction is not visible. It's not designed with fairness in mind. And there's no reason to believe that it collects the right amount to fund the network, right? The right amount is enough to actually pay for operating the network, but not more. Um, I just think MEV is a really poor way of funding anything. Uh, yeah, sorry. And with apologies for no, I'm to <laughs> for that. we're totally on the same page here. Ed. This is uh, this is exactly my stance. So yeah, um, let, let's back up a little bit um, and talk about the Arb Arbitrum nodes, though. So basically, so basically, when I have a I have a transaction, I will send it to a node. Who is that node? What does it do? And how is it incentivized? Sure, uh, the node could be anyone can run a node. You can run a node. Um, you know, you can just download the software and run it. We have um, so, um, I mean, the answer of who is the node is it could be anybody. Um, a lot of people will use a service provider. I think it's a lot like Ethereum. You can run a node yourself or you could use a you know, big service provider, a Infura or Alchemy or you know, any of the companies in that space. Um, it's kind of up to you. Um, in terms of how they get paid, there's different answers to that. Um, if you run the node yourself, you know, you're running it for your own reasons and you don't have to pay yourself. Um, if you're using a commercial service that runs nodes, then, you know, they're going to have some kind of business model. Maybe they have a free tier and you pay if you use it a lot. Maybe you use a node that's run by an application provider and their business model is they want you to use their application. They have some way of making money from their application and um, they're going to run a node to make that easier for you. Um, so, I mean, it's essentially the same answer as on Ethereum. It, there needs to be some reason for a person to run a node and it might just be self-interest, uh, or it might be part of either, it might be a part of a business model where they're, you know, they want people, they want to see this activity and, um, uh, happen more. And so they want to facilitate it. I know we run, we, the Arbitrum team, we run, uh, we run some, uh, some nodes, node services ourselves. But if I run an Ethereum node. I make money off of it, right? If yeah, if you're mining, you do. Although it's not a great business to be in if you just have a regular computer, right? You can buy a mining rig, and then maybe the economics of that work out. It, totally. But if I'm a staker, for instance, on East Two, yeah, you do make some money. Um, and we we don't have an incentive program for nodes. Um, we found that we don't really need it um, as of yet. So. The other thing to say is there are different, just like in Ethereum, there are different roles that a node can play. It can be a regular node, which is mostly servicing user requests, keeping track of the state. It could be what's called a validator, which means that it participates in the protocol, the settlement protocol to settle the results of transactions to, um, to Ethereum, or it could play a special role like the sequencer. Uh, there's only one of those, and someday there'll be, there'll be a limited uh, committee of them someday. But most nodes are just are like non um, uh, are like non staking nodes in Ethereum. Okay, and the staking nodes. What about those? So the staking nodes currently, um, right? Again, anyone can. Let's see. So the protocol allows anyone to run it. We currently have a limited list of parties who are doing it. Um, but the, um, the the direction we're going is toward. Uh, a model where anyone can run a validator and there are some parties who are invited to run a validator and they are compensated for that with, you know, some funds that come from, from, from the user fees, from the transaction fees. Because it's trustless um, and anyone can, sorry, anyone can run a validator. Um, we actually don't know who in general you you don't know and can't know who's running validators. And that's actually a, a feature that, you know, if you put yourself in the shoes of a person who's thinking of cheating and they're going to ask, they're asking, is there a validator who's going to call me out and, uh, and take my stake? Um, the fact that you can't know who might be running a validator is actually um, pretty valuable. The sort of su um, submarine validators are, uh, are an important aspect of the security model. So, so what happens to the transaction fees that users pay? Because basically um, sending transactions on Arbitrum, I mean, it's it's substantially cheaper than, than on mainnet, but it's not free. It's like on the order of like a dollar per transaction or so. Yeah. So 
the 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 short answer is it goes to pay the costs of operating the chain. But let me give you the long answer, which explains what those are. The biggest cost of operating the chain is recording that sequence of transactions on the Ethereum chain. It's Ethereum gas, right? And so um, the sequencer uh, pays the the biggest the biggest source of cost is the L1 gas that the sequencer has to pay to record uh, the trans the biggest part of the fees that you pay actually go to the sequencer to reimburse it for those costs. Um, other fees go to, 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 uh, to cover other parties' costs. Um, and so basically, that money all goes to pay for the sequencer's costs. It goes to um, validators, and it goes to sort of a core set of nodes. Um, and over time, this will, over time, we're moving toward more transparency in where those fees go. The algorithm for determining the fees is, you know, we're fully transparent about what that is. And we've talked about why the fees are set the way they are. But basically the, the, short, the, short, the short version of that is the fees, part of the fees go to reimbursing the sequencer for L1 gas costs. And the rest is L2 gas, which goes, which is paying for the sort of uh, the core nodes and 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 uh, and some validators. So, if you think of like the transaction fees that users pay in Arbitrum, uh, are, will these kind of be proportional to you know roughly the um, Ethereum transaction fees that you know, like you know some kind of percentage? I, well, roughly speaking, yes. That the component of transaction fees that is covering L1 gas, um, you know, how much you have to pay for the L1 cost of your transaction, that is going to depend on what is the L1 gas base fee, right? If the L1 base fee goes up, then the sequencer has to pay more to record your transaction, and you're going to end up, or you or other trans L L2 transactions are going to end up paying for that. Right, so because that's the biggest component in practice, when the Ethereum gas price base fee goes up, the uh, cost of Arbitrum transactions goes up as well. It it lags a little bit for some technical reasons. Um, it takes a little while for the Arbitrum mechanism to adjust, but fundamentally, the Arbitrum costs follow the Ethereum uh, gas costs, um, uh, and essentially, it's the cost of recording data. Now, Ethereum is moving toward changing its data model in ways that reduce the cost of the kind of data that rollups need. And so this so-called, this is the, the dunk sharding or proto dunk sharding stuff that people talk about in Ethereum research circles. And once that gets deployed on Ethereum, then um, the cost of recording rollup data on Ethereum will get much lower we think, and therefore that the cost of Arbitrum transactions and transactions on other rollups too will go down a lot. But that's basically right. The first approximation, most of your transaction fee goes to paying to record your transactions data on the L1 chain. You, you said earlier that um, basically I can force a settlement on L1 as an as a particip participant in L2, is there any way I can actually grieve the synthesizer by forcing it to settle much more often than it usually would and thus driving up the fees? So if you agree, you can post more um, checkpoints um, as a validator, um, but that's only going to cost you that's only going to cost you money because as a validator, if you're getting paid as a validator, you're getting paid per time, not paid per, per post. So that's only going to raise your own costs. Um, and if, if the checkpoints that you publish are honest, then it doesn't require anyone else to respond on chain. This is the optimistic part of uh, Arbitrum is an optimistic rollup. And the optimistic part is the idea that if somebody posts a correct checkpoint, that um, everyone else just does nothing, and the system after then there's a, then there's a challenge window, a window of time in which after someone posts a claim about what the checkpoint should be, um, 
there's a window of time in which anyone else can object, right? The person who posted the initial claim is staked on that claim, and they, they will lose that stake if they're lying. But basically, there's a window of time in which anyone else can object to it. And if no one objects after that window of time challenge window has passed, then the system will accept it. And that's obviously the common case. Because as a validator, your incentive is to not post a false checkpoint. If you do, you're, you're going to lose, lose, lose your stake. Um, and so your incentive is to post a correct checkpoint. And then everyone else's incentive is to look at that checkpoint and say, yeah, it's correct. I'm, I'm going to just wait um, until for the system to accept it. And then the system will accept it. That's sort of the common case. But if someone posts a false checkpoint, then you can come in and say, no, that's wrong. Here's the right result. And you can stake on that. And then there's going to be a challenge protocol that happens between the false staker and you, the honest staker. You will win that challenge because an honest party can always win the challenge protocol. That's the, sort of a guarantee of the protocol. And then you'll take half the stake of the loser and the other half gets burned. So you as an honest party can post a correct checkpoint. You can do that whether or not anyone else posts an incorrect one. And if anyone disagrees with you, assuming you're behaving honestly, you will defeat them and take their stake. Okay, fair enough. But how, as an honest validator, am I incentivized to post a checkpoint? Do I get extra credits for that? or Because I, I incur the gas fees, right? That's right. That's right. So whoever does that incurs a gas fee. And we don't currently have a mechanism to reimburse that gas fee. Currently... We post, we are, our team post correct checkpoints ourselves, and we just eat the cost of doing that. Um, but um, if we don't, then someone else can do it, and they, can, they would have to absorb the cost themselves of posting the checkpoint. A checkpoint gets posted every few hours, so it's not a large cost. It's a, it's a you know, medium-sized Ethereum transaction every few hours. Um, the biggest cost of... L1 gas cost of the system by far is, is the data recording that the sequencer um, does, and it does get reimbursed by fees. We will probably eventually move to a scheme where the system reimburses the gas costs of someone who posts a checkpoint as long as they don't post it too often. You started talking about the optimistic part of the roll-up. So, um, Kind of putting this into the larger context. So we've actually had several other guests on before to talk about roll up. So basically, we've 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 spoken with um, Alec Lukowski from uh, CK Sync and Eli Benson and uh, from the Optimism. Te we've also had the Optimism team on. So um, I I understand the fundamental difference between. Um, ZK rollups. So basically, you you post a fundamental proof, and basically that that proof is final you get instant finality it only doesn't work for all kinds of um, transactions but w whatever um and um, then you have the optimistic roll-up so how does how is arbitrum designed differently from how optimism works so there's a bunch of differences one of the biggest differences with optimism in particular is that arbitrum is a Arbitrum has a fully working and integrated fraud proof system. That is, and we, we've had that since the beginning, right? So we actually have the fraud proof system in existence and turned on, um, and it's integrated with the rest of the system. Um, so that's a pretty significant difference. Um, you know, it's not something that we say we're going to integrate in the future. In fact, we're proud of this. We are the only roll-ups, EVM-compatible roll-up system on Ethereum that actually has its security proof mechanism turned on and working. This is one of the harder parts of not only just building a fraud-proof or correctness-proof mechanism, but actually getting a complete protocol that includes it is pretty hard to do. And that's a reason why a lot of projects either haven't done it or are just promising it for the future. But we're, you know, we're proud of having every version of Arbitrum has had fully working and integrated fraud proofs. Um, I think that's a significant difference. You can talk about differences in design. For a long time, the biggest design difference between Arbitrum and Optimism was that we used 
interactive fraud proofs, and they used a, a non-interactive fraud proof mechanism. That is, they had a, it was an optimistic system, but if there was a dispute between parties, we would resolve it in different ways. Um, but about six months ago, maybe a bit more, Optimism pivoted and started using or said they would use um, interactive fraud proofs, which is the Arbitrum approach. Um, I mean, I think there's some technical differences between how the system work. Um, we, one of them is the first come first served sequencing system, which, um, you know, we talked about a bunch before. That's a thing that um, Arbitrum does and Optimism has a different approach that involves auctioning off the right to, to reorder transactions. But probably the system that is closest in design to Arbitrum among the ones that are out there is, is Optimism. And of course, you know, other systems that um, the other systems that you mentioned uh, use ZK uh, technology, which is a very different type of thing, which, and there the main difference is between optimistic and ZK is, um, in my mind, is cost. Um, optimistic systems are much cheaper by orders of magnitude um, to produce the proof. Um, and the reason is that the whole part of the protocol where you generate a very complicated cryptographic proof um, and, you know, the ZK folks always talk about how cheap it is to verify the proof, but producing a ZK proof is extremely expensive. Um, and an optimistic system, you don't have to do that. The, um, even in the worst case, the optimistic system, the cost of proving is much, much lower. You could, you could do proving on an ordinary machine for uh, an optimistic system in the case of a dispute. But because of the optimistic nature of it, if there's not a dispute, you don't have to produce a proof at all. Um, and that, of course, is the common case, and it's, uh, it's vastly cheaper. Cool. No, thanks. That's very helpful. I, I wanted to kind of come back to a topic that we touched on a little bit before, which is sort of the topic of like economics of it. So, we, you know, we talked about that, you know, there's this fee and most of the fee goes towards paying the L1 gas. Uh, but of course, there's also, you know, L2, you know, some, some additional fee, right? That's there. And uh, so I'd love to maybe if you could speak a little bit about that. And then I'm also curious, uh, for example, Optimism, right? They, they launched the Optimism token. I'm curious also if, if you have plans for, I don't know, Arbitrum token or like how do you see sort of the economic system evolve in the longer run? Sure. Yeah, let me talk about the fees. Um, you know, as I said before, the biggest component of fees is, is L1 cost. The, there is L2 gas. There has to be gas, right? Because you need the economic, you need to align incentives for users. Uh, because when a user submits a transaction, they are imposing cost on other parties. And they're using a resource that's limited, namely the throughput of the chain, right? So you need to have some kind of gas or charging in order to align those incentives and in order to keep users from just spamming the chain with junk transactions, right? And so Arbitrum does that in a way that's pretty similar to Ethereum. Um, we count gas and we, um, um, the gas fee is normally low. It will go up if the chain is busy, is congested. That is if, if people, if the transactions that are arriving are um, more than the, chain, the chain's capacity, then uh, just like Ethereum, uh, we have this automatic mechanism that raises the base fee um, so that you get um, essentially use, the, use, use that price mechanism to ration the limited, limited resource. But most of the time, um, you're running at, at sort of the minimum base fee. Um, so that's kind of how those fees um, are charged. And you know, we believe in a scheme where the fees should correspond to the cost of operating the system. Um, and that, and that, that's where that that should go. In terms of a token, um, you know, we have not launched a token. We have not felt the need to do it. All the growth that we've gotten is has been organic. We haven't paid anyone to use the system. Um, you know, we haven't done tokenomic stuff to try to get people to use the system. We've really focused on building a system that meets the needs of users and developers. The one thing we've said for sure is that we are is that if we do ever introduce a token, it's not going to be something that generates friction for users. It's not going to be something that every user of the system has to have or use or own. We're not going to charge fees in an Arbitrum token. 
Um, we think that you know there's huge advantages both in compatibility and just practically for user experience to have the native token of our chain be ETH and to have fees charged in ETH. Um, you know we haven't you know we haven't found we haven't seen the need to introduce a token. Um, you know we are thinking about decentralization and how governance could work going forward and what are the options there. Um, but um, but yeah, that's not um, uh, it's not uh, it's not a decision we've you know we've made to do. Because right now those ex those fees basically go to like off chain labs and then off chain labs pays like the different uh, yeah, parties. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, so the sequencer fees get go directly to the sequencer's account, and then the rest, right? We we distribute to those who are uh, who are involved in running. Um, in running the network. Yeah, over time, um, you know, we're moving toward more transparency about that as we, um, uh, you know, as we line up, uh, say, a, a, a suite of paid validators. And, and, we're, and we're thinking through how to, um, uh, what's the best way to have our community participate in these, this sort of decision making? That's definitely the you know the endpoint that we're aiming for is community participation in this, and we need to have there needs to be an economic model that's sustainable that covers the costs and so on. But you know we want the community to feel like they um, they have a role in uh, in talking through these issues and getting to us in getting to an outcome that that meets their needs. Okay, so let's talk about. Um, the larger ecosystem and bridges. So obviously you didn't design Arbitrum as a standalone system, but it kind of works in conjunction with Ethereum. And there are also um, bridges between Arbitrum and Ethereum to kind of bridge assets. Also, I mean, basically there are no native, uh, native assets that live on Arbitrum, right? So basically everything's bridged, I assume? Ah, there are some actually. Yeah, so there are some... Um there are some assets that were built natively on Arbitrum. Um, there's some uh, some applications that are Arbitrum native that have chosen to mint their their projects tokens on Arbitrum. So there are some of those, but uh, most of the value on Arbitrum has been bridged over from Ethereum. And how does uh, so basically you guys build and uh, and operate a bridge? How how does that bridge work? And how how do you envisage the bridge landscape in the future? Yeah, so we have a we have a basic bridge that can bridge ETH and ERC twenties back and forth. Um, and to bridge from L one to L two, it's a, I think, a pretty typical kind of architecture. So, um, you make a call to a contract on L one. So if you're say you're depositing ETH, um, I'll tell the story in terms of ETH, but it works pretty similarly if you're using a token. Um, so. Uh, you make a call to a bridging contract on L1 and you pay those ETH to that L1 contract, it will hold those ETH, it will lock them up. Um, and your call to, to do that transfer, you said what address on the L2 chain you wanted those ETH given to, usually your own address, right? Um, so when that bridge contract receives those ETH, it will lock them up and then it will send a trusted message up to L2 which causes the same number of ETH to be minted up on the L2 chain by the Arbitrum code and then deposited into the account that you asked it to go into. Um, and so, um, and then in the reverse direction, it's kind of a similar thing. There is, um, you make a call to a trusted um, pre-compile contract on the L2 Arbitrum chain saying that you want to transfer ETH that you own on the Arbitrum chain down to some address on L1. And that will cause a trusted message to get sent from the Arbitrum code on the Arbitrum chain to a contract on L1, which will cause those ETH that you deposited back at the beginning of my story to get unlocked and paid out. So basically, you lock the assets on L1, they get passed up to L2 and get minted up there. And then you can do the reverse operation as well. And we provide a bridge that does that. Um, one of the things that's important for ETH, the story is relatively simple for ERC-20s, you need to be a little bit careful to make sure that um, people don't, that each, yes, each token uh, address on L1 corresponds to a single token address on the Layer 2 chain. And so, you know, we have some functionality that lets people do that. 
But basically, we provide a basic bridge, and then um, other people can provide more advanced bridging services on top of that. And so we see, for example, one of the issues with an optimistic rollup is that withdrawing assets from layer two back to layer one has a delay. And that's because of that challenge period that I talked about before in the protocol, which in practice is seven days. And so if you don't want to wait seven days for your assets to get from the Arbitrum chain back onto Ethereum, then there's a, a number of different fast, um, fast bridge services that you can use that will basically, you can give them assets on, on the layer two chain and they will right away emit those assets back to you on the layer one chain, right? And so um, these third-party bridging services provide a bunch of value that people like, but they're kind of built on top of the basic bridge that we provide, which is the basic way that assets can be moved back and forth. In a way, the, the service that they're providing is a liquidity In provision effect, yeah. service and not a bridging service, right? Not so much bridging, yeah, but there are also people who build bridges between Arbitrum and other Layer 2 chains or between Arbitrum and other L1s besides Ethereum. What we provide in our basic bridge is just a bridge between Ethereum and, and, and uh, the Arbitrum chain, and then other people can build other things um, around it on top of that. And there's a lot of value for users in those in those sort of third party bridging and uh, liquidity services. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I have uh, an hour worth of questions about bridges, at least. Unfortunately, we don't have an hour. So basically, I will kind of cut this down to one question. So um, in in the future, um, how do you how do you think about different scaling solutions? coexisting do you think there i mean will there be roll up to roll up bridges um uh, i mean how, how do you see that working yeah i think there will be so you know there's a huge demand for scaling and we expect a large number of people to come into the space and some um you know web 2 companies and others to come in and bring a lot of demand and as much as you could, you know, as much as we and everyone and a lot of other teams are doing to try to scale up what you can do on one chain, um, the demand is going to be more than that. And so we're going to see, I think, multiple chains that are coexisting. Um, and some of them will be from the same technology from the same provider, and some may be different technologies from different providers. But anyway, there's going to be a need to bridge. Um, and so I think we're going to see more sophisticated bridging systems and more sophisticated thinking about bridging. I know that in our research team, we're thinking a lot about the multi-chain future and how bridging can work and what is the optimal way to do it without sacrificing security and so on. I think we're going to see a lot of innovation sort of at the protocol level in designing better bridging protocols. Um, and that's going to provide a ton of value because I do think we're headed for a multi-chain, uh, a, a future of multiple chains and not just like a single chain that wins. Cool. Well, I mean, we've covered a lot about Arbitrum, right? A lot of different aspects. I'm curious, maybe sort of as a, as a final thing, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what are the biggest things that are left to do? You know, what, what does the Arbitrum roadmap look like? So we have a few things that are coming up soon. Um, the first one is our Nitro upgrade. So this is kind of a rewrite of our entire software stack, which is which is going to lower costs and increase scalability by a large factor um, and is better in a bunch of ways. And that's currently on testnet, but we'll be migrating our Arbitrum 1, our, our sort of main chain over onto it as a sort of seamless uh, migration. Um, and that's coming up pretty soon. We're not talking dates yet, but, um, um, but it won't be too long. Uh, after that, um, we're 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 going to roll out another technology which we call Arbitrum AnyTrust, which is a way if if you're willing to make a mild trust assumption in addition to trusting Ethereum, in particular if you're willing to trust that two out of n members of a of a data availability committee are honest, then we can provide you with considerably lower cost by moving the recording of transaction data off of the Ethereum chain and onto a sort of replicated committee of data availability servers. So that's Arbitrum AnyTrust, and we're going to be rolling that out as well. Um, 
those two things are on our shorter term roadmap. After that, it's really about driving scalability. Um, we've, we have a bunch of uh, cool things in the pipeline which are going to drive scalability up further on a single chain. Uh, you know, we're thinking a lot about cross-chain bridging, um, and we're thinking about um, you know ways of supporting a multi-chain world because we think the demand is going to be there. Um, and uh, I think there's going to be a lot of innovation in that area. Um, that's kind of where we're headed. It's mostly about driving scale up and driving costs down. You know, I'm fundamentally a tech. I'm fundamentally a tech person. Not everyone in our team is. You know, we. Uh, to be to be successful in the space, you need a lot of different uh, a lot of different uh, types of skill and uh, and activity. And but for me, it's all about sort of driving the fundamentals of our technology forward. Um, and that's really what I'm you know going to continue to be to be focused on. We have some really really interesting things in the pipeline right now. We're heads down getting Nitro and uh, and Any Trust delivered. And after that, I think it's an open field. We're going to do a lot, and I think we can drive costs down a lot and scalability up a lot. Perfect. Sounds exciting, Ed. Um, where can people go to find out more about Arbitrum? Uh, well, you can go to arbitrum.io um, and to get information. If you're a developer, it's developer.arbitrum.io. Um, if you want to, you could look at the Block Explorer, our Block Explorer. If you want to see what's happening on our main chain, it's arbiscan.io. It's That's like the marriage of Arbitrum and Etherscan. It's the Etherscan's team's a block explorer built by the Etherscan team that um, that that lets you follow Arbitrum. You can follow us on Twitter at Arbitrum or Offchain Labs. Um, or if you're interested in the Nitro technology, you can probably just Google Arbitrum Nitro and get a bunch of information about about that, including information on how to get on the the test chain. That you know that is our roll up tech of the future and our roll up tech of the near future. <laughs> So yeah, that's all available. If you're interested in following me, I'm Ed Felton, F-E-L-T-E-N, on Twitter or uh, uh, or uh, you know you can find me online. Fantastic, thank you, Ed. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Um, I learned a lot. Thanks a lot for having me. This has been fun. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks so much for our listeners as well. And we look forward to being back next week.